Cleveland.com Browns reporter Ashley Bastock joins us in this week three. Know your enemy. Uh, the first time we've had two beat reporters on uh, Blue Rush at simultaneously. I feel special. Uh, Ashley, thanks for joining us. How you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling good. Thanks for having me, guys. I, I appreciate the invite. I think there's some interesting storylines to talk about in this one. So excited to get going with you both. I guess we can kick this thing off talking about the injury report from you guys' side of things. Uh, we heard that Miles Garrett may be limited and, and David Njoku may be out. Put some smiles on some Giants fans' faces, please, with your injury report. Yeah, well, let's start with David Njoku because I think he's the one where there's some more there's some more clarity on his current situation. He injured his ankle in that Cowboys game. Uh, he was actually a victim of an uncalled hip drop tackle, which we kind of saw, I think, plague the NFL throughout week one. That's supposed to be something they're emphasizing this year. Wasn't called. He's injured. Kevin Stefanski said yesterday he is unlikely to play. We did see him in the locker room. He did not practice. So I think just the nature of ankle injuries, this one's believed to be a high ankle sprain. He's also been sick on top of that high ankle sprain. We know that because receiver Amari Cooper actually mentioned that to us last week. So he's unlikely to play. Now, Miles Garrett has been dealing with Some exactly what that is, but we do know it's been bothering him since the Cowboys game in week one. So he played through that in Cleveland's 18 to 13 win over the Jacksonville Jaguars on Sunday. He played about 60% of their snaps. So he was still the D lineman that was out there the most, but important to note with this Browns defense, Jim Schwartz, the defensive coordinator, rotates their D lineman about eight to nine guys deep. So it's even hard to tell if this injury is something that's impacting the number of snaps he'd play because he'd be rotating out anyway. Yeah, um, um, Ashley, as a uh, beat, uh, a fellow beat writer, you know, we're not fantasy football, so I know people always ask you, the quarterback, the running back, the receivers, you know, we got to get down to the trenches a little bit because, um, you know, yeah. the Browns' two starting tackles have not played yet this year, right? So you got Jack Conklin, yeah. um, you have Jedrick Wills. Um, what is their status? Um, like Brandon said earlier, you know, put some smiles on the Giants' faces. Look, the Giants are 0-2. They need a lot of help. So um, if you want to get some Giants followers among Giants fans on your social media, you need to come out and say their tackles aren't playing and the Giants should have a field day. I have a feeling you're probably not going to say exactly that, right? Yeah, I think your feeling is right on that one, Phil. But, I mean, there might still be some good news for Giants fans. I know that your guys' readership, your listeners, watchers, everyone wants to get that pass rush going, right? I mean, just on paper, I think uh, it's probably shocking that they haven't gotten going yet. And I think there might be some room against the Browns' O-line to do it a little bit. Now, things are still very much in flux. As you said, Jedrick Wills Jr., their typical starter on the left side, has not played yet this year. Jack Conklin, they're all pro on the right side, has not played yet this year. But bad news potentially for the Giants might be that Jack Conklin was a full participant during practice yesterday for the first time all year. Uh, he's a veteran, so he was a left tackle in college at Michigan State. So if they had to, they could move him over to the left side. Now, the Brown situation is unique because we say their two starting tackles haven't played yet. But Dewan Jones has played, and Dewan Jones, I think at this point in his career, he's entering year two, he's basically a starter. He started uh, after Jack Conklin went down, and all three of these guys had season-ending knee injuries last year. So he replaced Jack Conklin. His knee injury wasn't until early in December last year. So he has a lot of starting experience, but now he's getting banged up. He didn't practice yesterday because the knee he had surgery on was sore. He told me, though, in the locker room that he fully expects to play in this game. So it sounds like we've heard players say things like that before and not play, but it sounds like he's at least trending in the right direction. I would say Jack Conklin potentially trending in the right direction, but I do think if Jack Conklin plays, they might kind of platoon these tackles a little bit. The other guy on the left side is James Hudson the third. He's in his fourth year. He struggled. He has a really bad pass blocker rating on PFF right now, only like 41.8, I believe. So definitely room. I Giants edge rusher after Deshaun Watson in this game. 
Yeah, we talked about off, uh, the Browns' offensive line. I, I got a next-gen stat here where they've allowed pressure on 40.4% of Deshaun Watson's dropbacks. And he's been sacked eight times, which is fourth most amongst quarterback in, quarterbacks in the NFL. I know it's only week two, but we're talking about a guy. Well, first and foremost, I know I'm talking with uh, beat, re- beat writers and reporters when we start off with offensive line and not quarterback. But uh, let's talk about the Browns' quarterback, Deshaun Watson. Do you feel like he's getting his juice back, Ashley? You know, maybe a little bit. I'm, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. I mean, the sack numbers, what's interesting about Deshaun Watson is like, this has always kind of been the player he is. He's a quarterback that's going to hold on to the ball longer. So while in week one against the Cowboys, I definitely think there were protection issues. In general, that's just kind of life with Deshaun Watson as your starting quarterback. You're going to take some sacks. Uh, And now in the Jaguars game, he didn't take the one sack he should have on third and six in the fourth quarter when they were trying to run down the clock, and it nearly cost them the game. But I do think it's interesting to kind of see them in that Jaguars game. The way I think they got their group back was going to the run earlier. They got Dante Foreman involved. Uh, He's a vet at this point, but it's his first year here. And he had no touches in their season opening loss to the Cowboys. So I do think getting him and Jerome Ford going early is key to helping Deshaun because that in turn opened up the pass game. I think the other storyline to be aware of is Deshaun Watson just hasn't found chemistry yet with Amari Cooper. I mean, Amari Cooper is a true number one wide receiver. I forget how many catches he ended up with on Sunday, but I do remember he was 0 for 4 on targets. And in each game, he's had dropped passes that would have been good for touchdowns this season. So tough break for those two. It's definitely something to keep an eye on, though, in this game. Paul? Yeah, actually, I have a, another insider beat writer question because, you know, Deshaun Watson, um, you know, the, the allegations, there were more allegations that, that came out this year. So so what what is the tenor and tone in his press conferences? You know, is it brought up and then yeah. does he have a statement? Is it, you, is it like, don't ask him? You know what I mean? He, look, he's been through this a lot. Right. You know, last year, you know, yeah. a lot. And this year it, it's up again. So what what and, you know, how, how is that dynamic with the media and the quarterback? Yeah, you know, I think more so it was really the story going into the Jaguars game last week. Those allegations, this newest civil suit, which is different than the other civil suits he's faced in the sense that this was a woman he went on a date with. All the other ones were sexual misconduct allegations in massage appointments. So that's still ongoing. The victim's attorney, Tony Busby, said she is due to speak with the NFL who is investigating this. Uh, He said last week and two weeks, so one week from now sometime, she is supposed to speak to the NFL in their investigation. But as far as the press conferences, that was really the main uh, focus of his press conference, his weekly press conference last Wednesday. Not so much this Wednesday, but in that press conference last Wednesday, uh, he said he is innocent. He strongly denied these latest allegations, which has kind of been the trend for him as each one of these civil suits has popped up. And during his time in Cleveland, uh, it's either a strong denial or a no comment because that's what my legal team said to do from his side. So I will say it was interesting last week, and this is where I can just tell this is like a Kevin Stefanski football team at this point, because every other player that we've asked about Deshaun, uh, whether this has the potential to become a distraction or players turning on Deshaun, so to speak. They've all said, nope, that's not the case. Like, we're focused on the game. This is a football team. People always have things happening off the field. So it's been interesting to kind of see that dynamic because the Browns, like, five or seven years ago, like, I don't think they'd be able to handle this kind of scrutiny. But there's some stability in Cleveland now with Kevin Stefanski in that head coaching role. And the players are always going to try and show some sort of united front. You never want that type of news to affect the locker room. But in terms of the player, I feel like it's affecting him. You get every question you get asked is going to be about these allegations, probably for the rest of your career. You look at the Chiefs bringing back Kareem Hunt. Andy Reid had to come out and say, oh, we did our we did our due diligence on him. We did background checks on him from after that matter when they had to uh, to release him. So for Deshaun Watson, there's only one way to kind of I don't want to say only one way, but to kind of lessen the heat that's on you is you have to play well. 
and he hasn't been playing well, and that's making people come out and continue to ask questions. Actually, we're dealing with – we got our quarterback uh, that's all throughout the media and all, but for different – for different reasons. Daniel Jones had a solid game uh, last week against the Commanders. How does the, the sports media in Cleveland and some of the players for the Browns feel about Daniel Jones coming into Cleveland Browns Stadium on Sunday? Yeah, well, we actually haven't had a chance to talk to many of our defensive players yet. The way the Browns do their media schedule, players are available to us Wednesday through Friday. And as we're recording this, I'm getting ready to head to the team facility to talk to more defensive players today. We won't hear from Miles Garrett until Friday afternoon either. So he's obviously the main guy that we're going to want to ask about Daniel Jones. But I do think looking at this defense, looking at this Browns defense, what they've struggled with, I certainly see some opportunities there. But you have Miles Garrett banged up. And the other problem is you have Denzel Ward, their Pro Bowl cornerback, banged up with a shoulder injury right now. So I think that's a tough break for the secondary. He was limited to only 11 snaps against the Jaguars. Now, he played 11 really good snaps, and he was on a pitch count. So they knew what they were getting going into that game. But certainly, I think you look at the number of interceptions Daniel Jones has, the number of times he's been sacked so far this season. There's certainly, I think, openings for this Browns defense to make some game-changing plays. And they've struggled to take the ball away so far this season. So I think we're going to hear more about that from them in not just this week, but the coming weeks, quite honestly. Paul, um, you know, you just mentioned Denzel Ward. Um, you know, I mean, obviously Malik Neighbors is 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 the story in New York. You know, I mean, he's 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 really good. I mean, I mean, I don't know how long you've been doing this. Not as long as me. I know that. Um, Eighteen targets from Malik Neighbors, right? Yeah. Eighteen nar- targets in one game. I mean, this is not Jerry Rice or, or Randy Moss. I mean, that is a lot of targets. Uh, caught ten passes, had a touchdown. He was terrific. Had a drop at the end that was really, really. Um, maybe the difference in in them in them winning the game you know maybe he was exhausted from all those targets so is would that be denzel ward um will will will, will would he shadow neighbors would they you know have maybe a safety over the top you know with jim schwartz what does he usually do when there is one top receiver because there's no question right now malik neighbors is the one top receiver on the giants Yeah, now we did hear from Denzel Ward on Wednesday, and I did get a chance to ask him about Malik Neighbors because I certainly think this is potentially the matchup of the game, especially if Denzel Ward is going to be able to play more snaps. So Jim Schwartz and his defense, he does tend to stick with man for the most part. You might see that safety shadow. I'll be curious to see if they're going to use Grant Delpit like that. He's really come into his own the last two years since Jim Schwartz has been the defensive coordinator here. But I definitely think he's the assignment. And it's interesting because the Browns also had a somewhat similar assignment last week against the Jaguars with mixed results against Brian Brian Thomas Jr., another strong rookie out of LSU. Now, he's a bit bigger than Malik Neighbors. He's 6'4". So that matchup, I think, was a little bit different. But some mixed results there. They didn't allow him many catches, but he still had the big 66-yard play that was one of the Jaguars' plays of the game. He ended with 94 yards. So I think this defense is going to be looking for some redemption, and I think it's going to be heavily one-on-one matchup based. Like this defense, they really trust their corners, whether it's Denzel Ward or Martin Emerson in particular on the outside. And Martin Emerson's a big guy. He's like Mm -hmm. 6'2", 6'3", very physical. Uh, He's in his third year now. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him get some matchups against Malik Neighbors as well. Yeah, Ward Neighbors is the main event, but Emerson, Robinson, or or Newsom, Slayton is the undercard. It, with all that man-to-man that Jim Schwartz plays and, and, and gets pressure with his front four uh, and his defensive line, there are matchups for Daniel Jones and these Giants wide receivers to win against some of the other corners out there. And I think that that's something that Brian Dable is going to have to do is take advantage of that. Who else can we – how how can we use neighbors to open up the offense for everyone else? Uh, Paul, you got one more before we get Ashley's uh, final thoughts? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, you know, as, as in New York, we're New York Giants centric. You know, the Giants need, you know, the Giants looked at their schedule at the start of the year, and it was Minnesota at home, at Washington, and then at Cleveland, right? So the feeling was the Giants are not a very strong team, but they 
could probably win two of those first three games. You know, I mean, you know, I, I mean, the Vikings were not considered to be a strong team. The Giants had them in the home opener. All of a sudden, Sam Darnold's, you know, looks like a credible quarterback. The Commanders are not a good team with a rookie quarterback, and then they, you know, they, they become the first team in history to score three touchdowns and not give up a touchdown and lose the game. I mean, I mean. Ashley, I'm sure you've been in a lot of games where it's like, boy, how did that happen? This is one of those games where, you know, I would have to sit down and talk to you and say, okay, this is how it happened. This is how incredible it was. The Giants literally didn't have a kicker who could kick extra points and field goals. So, I mean, that was bizarre. So, from the Browns' point of view, I'm sure at home they're looking at this game and saying, the Giants are 0-2. I'm sure they're respecting them, you know, respect all, fear none, all that stuff. But I'm sure these players feel this is a home game. We will take care of business and win. Is that correct? You know, I think that's probably a fair assessment. And I think you're right on the money, Paul, in that the Browns are going to say all the right things about this game, right? They're not going to want to give the Giants any bulletin board material. But we were talking in the media room yesterday, like even though the Giants are 0-2, like there's certainly some things which we've been talking about that I think there's a chance for them to exploit, particularly with the way Deshaun Watson has struggled to get the ball out quickly, knowing that the Browns have issues at tackle uh, and knowing that their two top defenders are dealing with nagging injuries right now. So I definitely think this is a prime example of even though the Browns are the better team on paper, they have the better record. Uh, it's tough to just come in and expect you're going to win just because you're at home, just because the Giants are 0-2. You know, Brian Dable obviously has a history here in Cleveland. I'm sure he's going to want to come in here and get the win, not just to avoid that 0-3 mark but yeah i think i think they are going to have to come out on sunday and show hey we're not just looking past the giants and looking oh we have the raiders next what's it going to be like when we go to vegas so definitely a, an important note i think going into this game it might not be everything that it seems on paper all right potential trap game absolutely love it i guess that could have been the final thought right there that was perfect yeah. ashley uh you got a lot of new giants fans you got a lot of new fans from uh <laughs> giants fans so go ahead and tell the people where, where they can find you on social yeah you can find me on twitter at ashley bastock 42 and our podcast is the orange and brown talk podcast that i host with my colleagues mary k cabot uh, who's a legend in this business and dan lobby so you can go check that out as well for a lot of the similar conversations we've been talking about i think there's some things that giants fans might like on there from the one we recorded yesterday well thanks for joining us thank you that was awesome awesome thanks guys